Well, we are in the second week of a series we started last week, Calling Card. And in this series, what we're doing is discovering the distinguishing characteristics that qualify our character so we can step into God's calling on our life. And last week, we talked about being faithful in small things. How many of you remember that? Yeah, yeah being faithful in small things. How many felt <laughs> convicted after that? Yeah. Am I just alone? No, yeah. Well, we said being faithful in small things is the door to more. And the message I have for you today, I think, is going to sink nicely with that. Um, but before we get into it, I, I want to give you some encouragement because, like I said, if, if you're feeling like I've felt, I mean, I can almost feel disqualified to speak to you about these things sometimes because I think about, man, I've missed it in that small area and missed it in that small area. And, you know, I'd begin to think, I don't even know if, if I should be preaching this message to you. But here's what I, I was reminded of that I, I told my son when he had missed some stuff on his test. He was upset. It had a test. He made some mistakes, got the wrong answer. And I said, you know, I know you're upset about this, but getting that wrong and seeing where you got it wrong is actually a good thing. Th that's the thing that enables you to learn. That's the thing that enables you to grow. The, the goal isn't to get it wrong. The goal is to get it right. But when you see where you've missed it and you see why you've missed it, well, now you can begin to make the change. And that's really what this series is about. We're going to reveal some things that maybe, maybe we've got some places where we've been missing it. Maybe we've got some places where we've been making some mistakes. And if that's you, congratulations, you're human. We're not perfect people here, but we are endeavoring to grow. See, this series is about spiritual maturity. God's plan for you, God's heart for you is that you would grow up spiritually. Because just like God has a call on your life, just like God has a plan for your life, you don't step into it automatically. I know God has great things for you, but just like God's heart for, for everyone is that they would be saved, you're not saved automatically. You, you have to accept what he's done for you. You have to receive it. Well, that same thing is true with God's plan for your life. You don't step into it automatically. You have to grow spiritually. So really my heart is that this series would prepare us for what God has prepared for us because our calling is always going to be connected to our character. So with that in mind, I want to get into our scripture today. Let's look in 2 Peter chapter one if you brought your bibles you can turn there i'm going to put the words on the screen so we can all follow along together second peter chapter one i'm reading from this is i usually put the the translation so you can look it up for yourself but this is the god's word translation and second peter is a letter that the apostle peter wrote it's the last letter that he wrote before he died he wrote it shortly before he was martyred in rome he was writing it to churches to stabilize them and strengthen them because much of early Christianity would connect with our situation where people were often drawn away to their own selfish desires. They were influenced by the culture. And so he's wanting to strengthen them and encourage them. He's also wanting to call them back and exhort them to live in the truth and to hold to the principles that they learned at first. And so he begins by saying, God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and for godliness. This power was given to us through knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and integrity. So just a reminder, God has called you. You're doing a good job. You can keep moving. Through his glory and integrity, he has given us his promises that are of the highest value. Through these promises, you will share in the divine nature because you have escaped the corruption that sinful desires cause in the world. Because of this, make every effort. Say every effort. Every effort. Make every effort to add integrity to your faith. Let me stop there for a minute. In other words, he's saying it's not enough just to have faith. I know that kind of sounds shocking. Now, it's enough to be saved and get to heaven, but he says if you're a Christian, it's not enough simply to have faith. You've got to have some of these 
character qualities. In fact, other translations where it says integrity, it translates it moral character or excellence of character. So make sure you add integrity, excellence of character, moral character to your faith. To your integrity, add knowledge. And to knowledge, add self-control. To self-control, add endurance. To endurance, add godliness. To godliness, add Christian affection. And to Christian affection, add love. And if you have these qualities, and they're increasing, it demonstrates that your knowledge about our Lord Jesus Christ is living and productive. In other words, if, if you've got character in your life, these things that we're talking, you're faithful in small things, you have integrity, if you've got this in your life, then it shows that the, the faith you have is effective. But if these qualities aren't present in your life, you're short-sighted, meaning you're, you're, God has more for you that, that you're missing, and have forgotten that you were cleansed from your past sins. And notice this. This is verse 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, use more effort. So he said, make every effort, and now I want you to use even more effort to make God's calling and choosing of you secure. If you keep doing this, you will never fall away. Now I want to read one more verse, and at first it's not going to seem like it connects with this, but Stay with me. I'm going to make a connection for you. This is found in Proverbs, verse 22. The writer of Proverbs says, if you have to choose between a good reputation and great wealth, choose a good reputation. So to make the connection here, we've got Peter who is dealing with being called by God, and we've got Proverbs that is talking about what we're called by others. And the truth in both of them is that being trustworthy is more valuable than a trust fund. It, it, it matters the way you live your life and not just how you live your life, but how people see you. Have you ever wanted to change the way somebody sees you? A lot of you. I, I'm glad I'm not the only one. I feel like there's few things that are more frustrating than having a reputation that you don't want. And I don't know what that reputation would be. We can guess, I'll throw a few of them out there. Maybe, maybe people think you're too loud. Maybe people think you're too quiet. Maybe people think you're too critical. Maybe People think that you are shy. Really, you're not shy. You just don't like them. That's why you don't talk to them. <laughs> Maybe you think you give a lot of compliments, but people think you're fake and insincere. There could be a lot of things about the way people view you that we can't control, but the question I want to ask you today is, are you reliable are you reliable that word reliable comes from this latin word which means to secure to fasten or to attach and that's why last week i had a door small things being the door for more this week I have a grappling hook because i want to talk about securing your calling that's what peter said right you've got to add integrity to your faith so that you can secure the calling that God has for you. And to do that, we're going to look at it through this lens of reliability. Are you reliable? Now, reliability, it involves your competence, your conduct, and your consistency. And I have to bring that up because we live in a world that has a reliability deficiency. How many of you would agree? I mean, it used to be we just had to deal with filters. Now, now we have to do, deal with, you know, completely fake artificial intelligence. And it's not just institutions that have very little trust. I mean, this era is called the era of misinformation because we don't know who to trust. There's bots and algorithmic bias and misinformation and disinformation, 
all these things. The, the point I'm making is that reliability is earned or lost when our repetition creates a reputation. That's why the first thing I want to tell you is this, that you're only as reliable as your reputation. I know we don't want this to be true because we like to be the determining factor on whether or not we're reliable. Like our opinion is what matters. But please know that despite what you might think, you're only as reliable as your reputation. I don't know about you, that doesn't really sit well with me because I can't control everybody's perception of me. And generally, I'm like, well, what's it matter what people think of me anyway? Like, I'm living for an audience of one. I need to please God. God knows my heart. And that's true. We don't live our life to win the approval of others. But I also want you to understand today that your reputation matters. If we're asking the question, are you reliable? Please understand, you're only as reliable as your reputation. You might not know this, but Scripture talks about our reputation in different places in Scripture. Uh, one place is in 1 Timothy. Paul, of course, of a great apostle, planted churches all over the known world, had his protege in the faith, Timothy. Timothy was a leader of the church and really leading multiple churches. And because he had so many churches he was over, he needed to raise up more leaders. So Paul writes to him, giving him some instruction and some qualifications to look for in leaders he was going to set over churches. Look at what Paul said to Timothy. If anyone is seeking a position as an overseer in the church, he desires an honorable and important work. Here are the qualifications to look for in an overseer. Number one on the list, a spotless reputation. Before he says other things, and he does list a number of other things, he says, if we're going to put leaders in the church, we got to make sure that they have a good reputation. And the thing is, he doesn't limit it to leaders. He goes on in just a couple other verses in verse 8. He says, these same standards apply to deacons. You might not know what a deacon is, and honestly, in different church world, deacon means different things, but a deacon is simply someone who serves in the church. So if you've got a red shirt on, guess what? You're a deacon. Don't go telling people that. You'll confuse them. But <laughs> you serve in the church. That's what he's talking about. And if you serve, in, you're on the production team or working on the kids' team or your admin team behind the scenes or you work with youth or the worship team or anything that you do, God wants you to have a good reputation. And the truth is, even if you are not in a serving role in the church, God still wants you to have a good reputation. Peter, who wrote this letter we're looking at, 2 Peter, in his first letter, he said something very similar to the church in the second chapter. He said, you are living among people who do not know God. So be very careful that you always live in a good way. In other words, you are representing Jesus to the world around you. So the, the way you conduct yourself, your speech, your attitude, your follow-through, your reliability, your conduct, it matters. Your presence matters. Now, because our reputation is based on other people's perceptions, it can be really frustrating to know this truth that we're only as reliable as our reputation because we know that in the world we live in, perception is often a far cry from reality. Yeah. And so much of social media is a false perception. I'm not down on social media. That's great. Use it. Awesome. But it's often a far cry from reality. People spend all sorts of time to create a persona, to project an image that is not true. And if you don't know how to do this, I want to give you a few tips today. First of all, when you take a selfie, always go for the high angle, all right? Not the low <laughs> angle. Nobody wants to see the double chin. Go low, you get a double chin, you go high. All right. That's, you got to work on the jawline, okay? You, you know what that is, right? Okay. Jawline, get that. If you, if you have group photo, never take it head on. 
Always turn to the side. The side's going to make you look thin. If you're a girl, you may want to bend your knee just a little bit. Get your booty nice and round. I see some of you taking notes. This is not the part to take notes on the sermon. But I'm just trying to illustrate people have no problem working hard to create a perception because they know perceptions matter. And I'm not advocating that we would be projecting an image today. I'm just illustrating that when somebody has a reputation problem, it often has more to do with perception than the facts. Now, again, you might think, what does it matter as long as I get my job done? That's, I mean, my work should speak for itself. Or what does it matter as long as I do my best? Or what does it matter as long as I've got the right heart? Well, the reason it matters is because those things on their own do not create reliability. Those things on their own do not produce reliable character. For example, you can be an expert but lack integrity. You can be an expert, be a jerk to work with. People aren't going to trust you. You can have a good heart but still make poor judgments. You can have a good heart but still not get the job done. It's when those things come together where you are faithful in your competence, your conduct, and your consistency, that's when you have good character. But too often people want the credit of good character, but they fail in their competence, their conduct, their consistency because they don't hold up under tension. Under tension. And that's the second thing I want to tell you is that reliability isn't proven by your intentions. It's proven intention. It's not proven by your intentions, it's proven intention. Most of us don't like tension in our life. Tension is painful, it's not comfortable, it's when we're being stretched, but reliability is proven in tension. Let me show you what I mean. Josh, can you run that up here for me? I've got an illustration and I just thought, what better way to prove reliability than if I hook this on the rafter up there? Is that okay? No. You, you don't trust me? You can feel the tension. All right. Well, let's try a different example. I've got a grappling hook. And until there's tension, I don't know if I can trust this to hold. It's, it's only the moment I put tension on this, well, now I know I can trust it. If I give it some slack, I don't know if it's going to hold me. If I let it off the hook, I don't know that I can trust it. But it's when there is tension placed on this relationship, well, now I know that it's reliable. Does that make sense to you? What does this look like in our life? Well, reliability with tension, it's after you've made a promise, but you know it's going to hurt you to keep it. It's when you maintain your standards even though your competitors are cutting corners. It's when you make a mistake and you own it, even though you know nobody else would have noticed it, you could have just not mentioned it and it would have been fine. It's when you continue to bless someone even though they curse you. It's when you are repentant instead of being defensive. It's telling an inconvenient truth when it would be more convenient to tell a lie. That's when reliability is proven, when there's tension, not intentions. See, many times we confuse intention with integrity. We think when there's tension, that's when we need to be cut some slack. This is when I have permission to get out of this thing. 
but reliability is proven in tension. I like the way Psalm 15 talks about it. Psalm 15, by the way, is written by David. I think that's important to remember when we're talking about reliability because there were times when David missed it. Well, David said this. He said, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? Well, who's, who's close to your presence? The one whose walk is blameless? The one who does what is righteous? Who speaks the truth from their heart? Remember, even if it's an inconvenient truth. Whose tongue utters no slander? Who does no wrong to a neighbor? Not running people down, not belittling people, not spreading rumors, and casts no slur on others? Who despises a vile person? Now, this is interesting because it's saying that a person who is pure in heart actually resists somebody who rejects God. Resist somebody who's dishonoring God. Resist somebody that's, that's not walking in the truth, who despises a vile person, an evil person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, meaning not just trying to get something out of everybody, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent, Whoever does these things will always be secure. Secure. It's talking about integrity. And I love this psalm because all of these things in here are not a one-time thing. It's what's done consistently. It's what's done repeatedly. It's kind of like a diet, you know, what you have to do to reach your goal, you have to do to keep it. Well, that same thing is true with reliability. You don't earn reliability and then you're just off the hook. If you want to be reliable, you have to maintain what you did to gain it. Now, your reliability is based off an observed behavior, not your intentions. And a lot of people fail the test with the best intentions. But I haven't really answered the question of what do we do because our reputation can be out of our control. Other people's perception is not something that we can always influence. And my encouragement to those of you in the room would be this, that if you will protect your integrity, you won't have to project an image. If you will focus on keeping this secure, you're not going to have to worry about how you're coming off. Now, The reason I bring this up is because this isn't about everybody liking you. Not everyone liked Jesus. There was this one time where Jesus was preaching and teaching in the synagogue, and while he was preaching, everybody loved him. But the moment he got done, these same people, all of a sudden they wanted to throw him off a cliff. Must not have closed very strong. They didn't like the way he ended The point is, people's perceptions are fickle. You can't always control how people see you, but you can control your integrity. That's the thing that you can focus on. You can't always control your image. There's people that are going to want to slander you. There's people that just are not going to like you. There, There are people that are going to oppose you. But even though you can't control your image, you can control your integrity. And this is the difference between having godly character excellence of character, moral character, being a hypocrite. Now, we use that word hypocrite. We hear about that, but that's a Greek word for actor. If you were an actor, you were a hypocrite. And the reason they called them hypocrites, well, they would have to wear different masks because they would play multiple characters. You know, the the truth is, anytime we're needing to project an image, we're concerned about how we're being viewed, it's probably because we're acting out of character in another area of our life. See, reliability isn't something you can just project. If you look at Jesus, he was always harder on the hypocrites than he was on any other person. He said it this way. He says, don't say anything that you don't mean. 
This counsel is embedded deep in our traditions. In other words, this is an old rule. They would have been familiar with this. You only make things worse when you lay down a smoke screen of pious talk saying, I'll pray for you, and you never do it, or saying, God be with you, but you don't mean it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. How many of you know some people that are always trying to make their words sound more weighty by making what they say sound more spiritual? You don't need to do that. That's with deep spiritual concern that I'm coming to you. Well, just just tell me the truth. (laughs) All right. In making your speech sound religious, you only become religious. It becomes less true. Look at what he says. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. The, the fact of the matter is, what we say should match what we do. Here's how I like to think about it. The audio needs to match the video. You ever watched a, a video that wasn't synced up? It's con- you're sending mixed messages. You're sending a confusing signal. So if something matters to you, it should be evident. It should be visible. If something, if you said you're going to do something, you should, you should do it. You don't need to add weight to your words. You don't need to make a promise. You don't need to swear an oath. Just let your yes be yes and your no, no. Because the truth is, nothing damages our Christian witness more than being unreliable. Because when this gets loose, our credibility gets lost. But I, I want to close with this because when we're talking about this subject, it's very important we remember this idea to not ever confuse our reputation with our righteousness. We're talking about character. We're, we're talking about spiritual maturity. And God wants you to live with integrity. He wants you to be faithful. But sometimes, if we're not careful, we can come into moments like this and think, man, I'm, I'm missing it. I'm not worthy. I've messed up too much. I know where I fell short. I know what people already think about me. And that's why I want to remind you of something Paul said when he wrote to the Corinthian church. Look at this. He says, don't imagine us leaders to be something that we aren't. We're guides into God's divine secrets, not security guards posted to protect them. In other words, he, he's saying, even though we're leading, remember, we're servants just like you. None of us ever get to this place where we're just free from this stuff. All of us are on the same path. We're, we're guides. We're walking this path with you. The requirements for a good guide are reliability and accurate knowledge. In other words, we've got to believe the right things and we've got to live in a way that's faithful. That doesn't change. It matters very little to me. This is interesting. What you think of me, even less where I rank in popular opinion, I don't even rank myself. Comparisons in these matters are pointless. I'm not aware of anything that would disqualify me from being a good guide. In other words, as far as I know, I'm looking within, I'm living with integrity. But that doesn't mean much. The master makes the judgment. Here's what I'm trying to say. It's important that we're reliable. That's our job. But my security isn't in what I'm able to do, my ability. My security is in who God is. I'm letting him hold my calling. And that's important because God's reliability is the basis of my faith. That's why I like to look at Bible stories because I mentioned David earlier. But you look at the people God uses, every single one of them at some point in their life failed in reliability. And Abraham, who's considered the father of faith, he doubted God's promise. Moses, who wrote the first five books considered to be a prophet and the, represents the law. And when he knew what God wanted him to do to be a deliverer, he, 
ran into hiding, killed a man. There's Rahab who was used in a mighty way to help the people of God go into the promised land. She was a prostitute. She had a bad reputation. But yet, God used her to actually be in the lineage of Jesus. Peter, who we're looking at, he denied Jesus. Paul, he was a Christian killer. Every one of them failed in reliability at some point. But when you look at all these people, you realize that God is faithful even when we're not. And if you place your faith in Christ, God no longer sees you through your reputation, but through his righteousness. That's a great thing about church because it's a place that you can come in and lay down the labels that you've accumulated, the names that you've picked up, what people have called you. Because sometimes the things people say about you are true. You can lay down what you've been called and you can pick up a calling. It really begins with one decision to turn toward Jesus, place your faith in him, and his righteousness will come on you.